All right, as the last few people trickle in, I think we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I guess on the East Coast, it's two o'clock. So for those of you who are joining us there, good afternoon. Uh, if you're joining us from the West Coast, it's not quite past noon yet. So good late morning to you. Welcome to the Optimization Case Study, Web Accessibility and SEO at the CFPB, hosted by the Web Analytics and Optimization Community of Practice at digital.gov. My name is Tim Loudon. I'm the uh, lead of the Web Analytics and Optimization Community. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, as a description for accessibility, I'm nearly bald. I'm wearing clear rimmed glasses and I have on a black shirt. <laughs> a few housekeeping things to go over before we get started. As a reminder, this session is recorded and we ask that you please abide by the TTS code of conduct when participating in any digital.gov hosted meetings. The code of conduct is linked in the chat. You can check it out there. Also, there is live captioning for this event. If you're in the Zoom app, you can use the integrated live captioning by selecting CC button at the bottom of the screen. And if you prefer live captioning in a separate window, there's also a link to that in the chat. As a reminder, all attendees will be muted and encouraged to ask questions via the chat. The Q&A section will be at the end of the event. Uh, our fine presenters today have a lot of good content that they're going to be running through. So we hope that we have a good amount of time at the end, but if not, we'll give you options to be able to uh, ask your questions after the event is over. Feel free to provide comments and introduce yourself in the chat box right now. Um, don't forget that in the chat box, the default is set, or uh, uh, the default is at panelists only. So if you want to send something to everyone, you have to hit that little drop down and click everyone. Uh, finally, there will be a survey that's sent to you after this and also towards the end of the presentation. It'll be in the chat box. The link will be in the chat box. We really, really, really appreciate anybody who takes the minute or two to fill out the satisfaction survey. It makes sure that we, uh, both at the Web Analytics and Optimization Community of Practice and at digital.gov, are delivering you events that are valuable to you. So with that, now that I got that all out of the way, I'm very excited today to have three guests from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. They are technologists that cover web development, UX design, and analytics expertise. And they have put together uh, a presentation that really demonstrates a lot of the good work that they're doing at CFPB. So without further ado, I want to make sure they have time. I am going to introduce Andy Chosak, Sana Kim, and Callan Pfeiffer. And I think Andy's gonna kick us off, right Andy? Yep, thanks Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Andy Chosak. I'm a senior web developer at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm joined today by my two co-presenters from the CFPB, Sana Kim, a senior user experience designer, and Callan Pfeiffer, a web analytics specialist. Today, we're gonna to be speaking about web accessibility and search engine optimization at the CFPB. Before we begin, our agency policy requires that I read this disclaimer. This presentation is being made by a Consumer Financial Protection Bureau representative on behalf of the Bureau. It does not constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are the presenter's own and may not represent the Bureau's views. I want to give a brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. First, I'll give a short introduction to the CFPB and our website for those who aren't familiar with us. Next, Sana and I will talk about how we ensure the accessibility of our website. Finally, Callan will discuss how we ensure the discoverability or SEO of our website. Uh, slide four, the CFPB and our website. First, for those who aren't familiar, a brief introduction. Uh, slide five. Um, here's the logo of the CFPB, and as this slide says, the CFPB is a U.S. government agency that was created shortly after the 2008 financial crisis, and our agency aims to make consumer financial markets work for consumers, responsible providers, and the economy as a whole. Slide six. In 2021, we celebrated our official 10-year anniversary as an independent government agency. And here are some numbers that we presented at the time. As of summer 2021, our supervisory and enforcement efforts had resulted in approximately $14.4 billion in relief for consumers. Over 7.3 million consumers 
had accessed the COVID-19 educational content we created since the beginning of the pandemic, and our Office of Consumer Response had received and processed over 3.1 million consumer complaints. Slide seven. The main CFPB website is located at www.consumerfinance.gov. Here you can see a screenshot of our website in both desktop and mobile form factors. Our site serves a large and diverse audience. It has more than 8,000 pages and lately has been getting around 2.6 million visits per month. Our website serves multiple audiences, including both consumers and the financial institutions that we regulate. Our content appears in multiple languages with a dedicated Spanish site and content also provided in many other languages besides English. And our content is served to multiple devices. It's a responsive site that serves both desktop and mobile users, and one that's also accessed by various assistive technologies. Slide eight. Our site has a wide diversity of content as well, from educational guides and interactive tools for consumers to regulatory and legal text. We also have research databases, press releases and blog posts, and more. Slide nine. Here's a few screenshots that show some of this variety. While you can probably see some consistencies, there are also differences in terms of the functionality, the interaction patterns, and the content. And that's because these pages serve very different goals, use cases, and audiences. Slide 10. Next, I'll turn it over to Sana to talk about how we ensure accessibility across such a large and diverse website. Thanks, Andy. Um, I'm Sana, uh, my pronouns are she, her, and uh, I have black hair and eyes, I'm wearing red glasses, and I'm wearing a light gray sweater. Um, yeah, let's move on to slide 11, please. Um, so taking a step back, what does it mean to ensure accessibility for all? We think of it as creating an inclusive experience for the millions of people we serve who have a wide range of abilities. So that includes people with visual impairments who might use screen readers with magnification to read content, people with auditory impairments who use closed captioning or transcripts, people with physical impairments who may not be able to use a mouse and may rely instead on keyboards, touch screens, or other devices, and people with cognitive learning and neurological impairments, which is a diverse group with many considerations for accessible design. There are steps we need to take as designers and developers to ensure that all of these people that we serve can access the tools and resources we provide. Um, let's move on to slide 12, please. Of course, there are also federal requirements around accessibility that we are required to meet. Uh, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 requires federal agencies to ensure that all electronic information technology is accessible to individuals with disabilities. The standards that govern what this means were updated in 2018 as the revised Section 508 standards. The CFPB is required to comply with these, and we have a Section 508 program manager who oversees our efforts. The World Wide Web Consortium publishes what are known as the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG for short. These guidelines contain recommendations for making web content accessible. They're organized into three levels of, of conformance with level A con, sorry, corresponding to baseline minimum standards and level AAA representing the highest level of conformance, ensuring a site that's broadly accessible by many users. So the revised section 508 standards in effect state that all electronic content should conform to WCAG 2.0 AA guidelines. So we design, build, test, and remediate to conform to those standards. And legal requirements aside, Accessibility is also really important for good SEO, as Callum will discuss later in this presentation. Um, let's move on to slide 13, please. So ensuring our work is accessible can be a challenge given that we have a multidisciplinary team that includes UX designers, graphic production designers, content strategists, and web developers who produce a wide variety of content spanning web, print, and multimedia. The images shown here um, are examples of each of these types of work. The first image is a screenshot of our website, specifically showing a page that provides help for homeowners and renters who are financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The second image is a photo of our home loan toolkit, which is a print product that includes guidance and forms for people in the process of buying a house. 
And then the last image is a still from one of the many videos we have created for consumers. Um, and this particular one has tips to avoid financial fraud and scams. So given the wide variety of content, the many skill sets and tasks we individually pursue, it's really important for us to have strong strategies and processes to ensure that all the products we create are accessible. Um, let's move on to slide 14, please. Um, so how do we do this? From a process perspective, our team approaches uh, accessibility as a never ending cycle between producing web and print products that are designed to meet accessibility standards and auditing and remediating the finished products we've produced. Um, you can move on to slide 15, please. For web accessibility specifically, we have four strategies that we follow that we'll now talk about in more detail. The CFPB design system, a manual accessibility audit process, automate, automated accessibility testing, and then a relatively new initiative, qualitative testing with users of assistive technologies. I'll turn it back now to Andy to talk about the design system. Thanks, Anna. Slide 16. So the first strategy we'll talk about is the CFPB design system. Slide 17. For those who aren't familiar with design systems, a design system is a set of reusable components that supports creating consistent and accessible designs at scale. You may have encountered this concept under a similar name, such as a pattern library or a style guide. Essentially, a design system can be thought of as a set of reusable building blocks which are each well-designed as a standalone component, but can also be combined in various ways to form more complex products. Here we can see three examples of those building blocks from the CFPB design system. On the lower left, we have a subset of our color palette, which defines the standard colors that we use in all our products, web, print, and multimedia. Our design system gives each color a name, for example, CFPB green, and provides the technical specifications so that each color can be reproduced as needed. In the middle, we have our fonts as they appear throughout CFPB products. This includes how the text might appear at different weights. On the right, getting slightly more complicated, we see a common web component, the button. The design system documents the standard implementation of what CFPB buttons look like on web pages in different scenarios, a primary button, a secondary button, a disabled button, a button performing a destructive action, and so on. Slide 18. On this slide, we have some examples of how these building blocks can be combined to form more complicated patterns. Fonts, colors, buttons, text inputs, and other controls can be combined to create a wide variety of different web forms. Here we see several exemplary forms from the CFPB website for a variety of use cases. For example, filtering a list of blog posts, signing up for a mailing list, or submitting feedback. Regardless of the specific content or use case, you note that each of these forms is built from the same basic components. We use our design system to define and document these small reusable pieces, which makes it easy to then pick them up and put them together in these more complicated ways. Slide 19. At the CFPB, our design system is implemented as a public website located at the address you can see here. Uh, this site is available not only to CFPB teams internally, but to the broader public as well, so that anyone can go to learn about how we design and build our products. You can see a screenshot of the landing page here. The site contains the visual designs, the source code, and the documentation all in one place so that everyone on our team is working off of the same reference. Slide 20. Our design system is organized into different sections. The foundation section covers our most basic design principles such as color, grid, typography, by standardizing these basic best practices, we can try to create a consistent, clear, and trustworthy experience for our audience. The components section documents these individual elements that can be used to create a web page, such as buttons, checkboxes, links, banners, tables, and so on. And then the pattern section documents how multiple components can be combined to achieve a goal, for example, creating a web form or organizing multiple pages of search results. And the design system includes both general and component specific accessibility guidelines throughout for all these different parts. So that way we're making sure that these components are built with accessibility from the ground up. Uh, slide 21. So on this slide, we're showing some screenshots of an example layout pattern from the design system, which is our hero module. So a hero introduces a collection of pages by providing a brief description of their content along with a visually 
impactful graphic. So this is what the hero page looks like in the CFPB design system website. It introduces the concept, provides content guidelines, and then contains a few visual examples of what heroes look like and how they should work. It includes different variations. For example, a hero with an illustration versus one with a photo. There's a specific variation with a darker background to ensure that we use appropriately colored lighter text when needed so that a hero uh, remains visually accessible with proper color contrast. Slide 22. The final aspect of the design system that I wanna mention is how we integrate it into our day-to-day -day work. Uh, I've already described the design system website that our team uses for reference and collaboration. The website itself is also open source to the public, which means that anybody can see its source code, make suggestions or propose modifications. The design system also includes several integrations for web developers, which allow for easy reuse of our patterns. We've published the components as a public NPM package, which is a redistributable way for developers to easily integrate them into any website. Uh, we've also built an integration into the Wagtail content management system that we use at the CFPB. And the idea behind these integrations is to make it as easy as possible for not just our team, but any team to build accessible web products using our designs. Oh, slide 23. Uh, so now that we've talked about um, how we standardize building with accessibility in mind, I'm going to turn it back to Sana to talk about how we test to make sure that our finished work is actually accessible. Thanks, Yandy. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to focus on our manual accessibility audit process. Um, we can move on to slide 24, please. Um, so first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of the manual audit. The audit is a comprehensive process to ensure we're complying with Section 508 requirements. Doing this manual audit helps us catch and fix errors, and of course, it is the law. Um, but beyond that, having our team members perform this audit is really important in that it helps us build empathy for the users we serve by understanding more closely the access issues they face on a day-to-day -day basis. It also teaches us what accessibility issues to be aware of so that we can bake consideration of them into the design and development process rather than catching errors after the fact. Um, we can move on to slide 25, please. Um, now I'll talk about the audit itself. Our team built this audit to ensure compliance with Section 508 WCAG 2.0 um, AA success criteria, although we did add some additional criteria to cover specific needs, for example, we added some WCAG 2.1 criteria to cover mobile devices since a large portion of our audience comes in on mobile. The audit, the audit is built to be easy to use by a wide range of disciplines. The audit criteria are captured in a spreadsheet. The instructions are written to accommodate the, the equipment that our team has, MacBooks and iPhones. Um, overall, it's structured into five sections. Uh, the first section covers HTML validation and some automated checks, mainly to ensure the page is read consistently by different devices and browsers. The second section consists of screen reader testing. So VoiceOver is a free screen reader that comes bundled in with the Mac operating system. We use it to run specific tests that ensure a page can be read, accessed, and interacted with. In the third section, we run tests on a page using only our keyboards, for example, to make sure there are no keyboard traps. The fourth section, we run tests using our iPhones, taking advantage of the iPhone's VoiceOver assistant to ensure that everything can be read and interacted with. And then finally, we have some additional tests for sensory sensitivity and forms, for example, to check that people with color blindness can still read our content. Um, you can go to the slide 26, please. Um, just a bit about how the manual uh, audit is run. Um, as our model demonstrates in this photo here, find a comfy spot on the floor. This is optional. Um, you open the audit in one window and then separately open the page that's being tested either on desktop or on an iPhone run a rate each step, and then perform additional steps to calculate the severity of a bug. Uh, slide 27, please. Um, this shows a screenshot of the mobile section of the audit. The screenshot is showing tests to ensure that all content and functionality of the page is, is accessible using the voiceover feature of the iPhone. So you can see there are specific pass-fail criteria to follow. In this instance, we rate as fail if you can't move through the page or perform any interactions when you swipe right to go forward or swipe left to go backwards. Based on the pass fail rating and the page type, uh, the bug severity column at the far right auto populates with either critical, high, or medium, which allows us to understand the urgency with which we need to address the bug. 
So for example, submitting financial complaints is a mission critical service provided by the CFPB to the, to the public. An inability to use voiceover to submit a complaint would be a critical bug that needs to be fixed immediately. Um, let's go on to slide 28, please. Uh, in terms of when we run the audit, we run it before a new page or product launches, when we create new components or patterns in the design system or modify existing ones, and then the entire team runs periodic manual audits of key pages on the website. Uh, the audit is open source. It's available to download on the design system at the link shown here. Um, we're also going to provide that link at the end of the presentation. If you use it, we'd really love to hear what you think. Um, we'd love to incorporate any process improvements. So please do give us your feedback. Um, let's move on to slide 29. Andy's now going to talk about our third strategy for web accessibility, um, automated accessibility testing. Thanks, Anna. On uh, slide 30 now. So the manual audit that Sana just described is a thorough way to test the accessibility of a web page. Unfortunately, it doesn't scale very well. Uh, recall that the manual audit includes testing a page on a desktop computer, on a mobile device, and using voiceover to verify compatibility with screen readers. All these steps take time, which means that it could take a person an hour or more to sit down and manually test a page thoroughly. And as we mentioned earlier, we have many pages on our website. We're always releasing new content and we always want to be ensuring that our pages are accessible. Happily, there are some parts of the manual audit that can be run automatically with no human intervention needed. This means that instead of needing a person to sit down and click a button or use a keyboard to test something, we can write a software program so that a computer will run the same process without needing the person in the loop. For example, Part of the manual audit is running an HTML validator against a page to confirm that its source code meets with accessibility standards. But we don't need a person to manually run the validator if it's something that a computer can do automatically on its own. Of course, there are going to be some tests that only a human can perform. We can't fully replace manual audits with automation and we don't want to, but automated testing results can still be valuable even if they're less comprehensive than manual ones, and even if they give us only a partial measurement of accessibility. Automation can still allow us to scale some portion of our testing, can give us a high level measurement of how accessible we are, and can detect some major accessibility issues automatically. So our goal of pursuing an automated testing framework is to regularly check our pages for accessibility issues using automated accessibility testing tools. There are various accessibility tools in the space, such as Wave, Axe Tools, and Google Lighthouse. These tools make it possible to automatically test against accessibility standards like WCAG. The testing includes checks like, does the page use standards compliant HTML? Do form fields have unique labels? Do images have alt text and so on? We configured these checks to automatically run against the CFPB website on a regular basis. We then collect those test results in a single place for easy review by our team. At the CFPB, we use Google Lighthouse. And since we're most familiar with that tool, we'll show you how we used it to create our accessibility testing dashboard. Lighthouse is built into the Google Chrome web browser. Here's how to run Lighthouse against a single web page. First, open the URL to be tested in Chrome. Then open the Chrome developer tools, click on the Lighthouse tab, click Generate Report. And after about 30 seconds, Lighthouse displays a report with the page's test results. On the right side of the screen, we see a screenshot of a browser that shows what this looks like. At the top of the screenshot, we can see the individual page that was tested, which was a recent blog post on the CFPB website aimed at helping consumers protect their finances during the coronavirus pandemic. At the bottom of the screenshot, we see a few circles indicating the different scores that Lighthouse gave to this page. This tool includes audits for performance, accessibility, search engine optimization, and more. The scores range from zero to 100 and are colored red, yellow, or green, depending on how the page scores. In this case, we got all green, so it looks like we're doing okay. For example, this page got a 100 on the performance audit, which measures how quickly the page loads and renders. Unfortunately, 
we only scored a 95 out of 100 on accessibility, which means that even on these totally automated checks, there are a few things for us to fix. Slide 32. Here's what the full accessibility test result looks like for that page. On the left screenshot, the report lists the few audits that failed. In this case, the page had an issue where an element that was being hidden from screen readers could still be improperly focused in some cases. It included an embedded iframe that was missing a title, and it also had some missing heading levels. Each of these errors can be expanded for additional detail on which element failed the audit and documentation on how to fix it. On the right, the report lists the 22 audits that passed su successfully. These checks validate the use of ARIA labels throughout the page, form elements being properly accessible, images having proper alt text, and several other important items. The Lighthouse report also includes a list of additional items that require manual testing. As mentioned earlier, we know that there are certain checks that automated tools like this can't do by themselves. And so it's convenient that the report includes a list of some of those tests here. Slide 33. Now that we've seen what an accessibility test result looks like when run automatically against a single web page in the browser, we can also write software to have a computer run this tool automatically on a schedule. So first, we need to choose which web pages to test. We want to start with the pages that are the most popular or high profile, for example, the site homepage. Ideally, we also want to test pages that have recently changed. It's often new content, new designs, or new functionality that can introduce accessibility bugs. Next, we write software to configure a nightly process to run the tool automatically against the pages that we've selected. We take all these testing results and collect them in a single place. And then finally, we create a user-friendly dashboard that lets our team easily review those testing results to take action to fix any issues that were discovered. Slide 34. Here's what our automated accessibility testing dashboard looks like. It lives at the web URL displayed here, available to the public, and is updated automatically every night with the latest testing results. On the left screenshot, the dashboard lists each URL that was tested, the date of the most recent test for that URL, and the top level Lighthouse test scores for both a mobile device and a desktop browser. The little yellow icons indicate scores that are particularly low and require more immediate attention. The dashboard also includes links that allow the user to click through to see the full detailed reports. On the right, we can click through to the history of any specific URL to see how its performance has changed over time on both mobile and desktop. This view is intended to track when issues began or are resolved and can assist in troubleshooting what might have changed to hurt a page's score. Um, slide 35. So like much of what we've discussed today, our automated accessibility testing dashboard is also open source. The project has received contributions from developers outside of the CFPB and has already been adopted by another team in government. Uh, we would welcome all interest from others in continuing to develop it. Internally, our team regularly reviews the testing results to identify and fix issues, not just with accessibility, but also with website performance in general. Uh, the dashboard is automatically kept up to date with the most relevant URLs so that we make sure we're testing the most important pages on our site. Um, slide 36, I will hand it back to Sana to discuss our fourth strategy for web accessibility, qualitative testing with users of assistive technologies. Thanks, Andy. Um, we can go ahead to slide 37. So as a fourth strategy, we've just started usability testing with people who are vision impaired, specifically who use assistive technologies like screen readers and magnifiers to access web content. So this is a pretty important step we've been wanting to take for a while. There's no substitute for direct observation and feedback from people as they're using the site. Um, it helps us better understand the context for issues that might be captured as part of an automated or manual audit. It can sometimes even reveal issues that can't always be caught with their audits. So for example, pages that have a lot of content that are particularly hard to navigate for people who are visually impaired, um, good usability principles and accessibility principles apply here. Um, the page might require a better restructuring of content with headings, uh, removing or consolidating content and so on. 
Um, so in March, we ran a short usability testing, uh, short testing pilot with, to understand the logistics and feasibility of conducting remote testing with people who use screen readers. Um, it's tough to say anything definitive since it was a limited pilot, but our small pool of participants thought our site was very accessible and only had a few minor points of feedback. But more broadly, uh, the pilot was important in that it gave us insights into the planning logistics needed to run this type of remote testing uh, with people who use screen readers. Our plan is to share those insights with our colleagues to help increase this kind of testing throughout the Bureau. And we also plan to investigate testing with people who have other types of disabilities. Um, if you've run testing with people with disabilities and you have any insights to share, we would love to hear them. Um, please do reach out to us if that's the case. Um, and yeah, let's move on to slide 38. All right, so now that we've finished discussing uh, how we keep our website accessible, we're going to shift focus. Callan is going to talk about SEO and the strategies we use to optimize web content discoverability at the CFPB. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sana. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Callan Pfeiffer. I'm a web analytics specialist here at the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm wearing a uh, light blue dress shirt and uh, black glasses, and I go by the pronouns uh, he, him. Um, I'm going to be talking about website discoverability and SEO today. Um, website discoverability has become increasingly important, especially um, with the pandemic, with more and more people searching online. Uh, nowadays, if uh, if users uh, cannot discover your website online, then um, quite simply, your, your website will not be successful. Your website, your business will not be successful. Uh, next slide, please. So what is SEO? Um, well, SEO stands for search engine optimization and uh, search engine optimization is the process of increasing organic visibility for relevant queries that your target market is actively searching for um, in popular search engines like Google, Bing and DuckDuckGo. Now, important to note, um, not all search engines are necessarily created equal, uh, with Google having over 90% of total uh, user traffic. So 90% of people of, of the searches that are being done on the internet are taking place uh, through Google. Um, and as a result of that, um, some, of our, um, so some of our technical recommendations are based upon um, the Google the Google search engine, um, in particularly based on um, recent algorithm updates that have recently um, been made by Google. Um, that being said, a lot of these core principles can still be applied to other search engines. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is slide 40, and we're going to talk about the role of optimized content. Um, so content, um, you've heard content is king before. That's a, that's a big saying in SEO. Um, it sounds a little cliche, but it definitely is true, especially in, in 2022 um, and beyond. Um, your content should have a general um, structure. It should have a general flow. Uh, it should get more granular as the content progresses. Um, and you should also utilize keywords uh, throughout the headings, throughout the copy, and make sure that you're um, linking to them properly. Um, this is a good example of one of our resources page where we have a pretty good um, structure in terms of our heading structure and um, subheading structures, you can see that we're uh, building authority, starting with resources for practitioners and then drilling down into resources for the people you serve and resources for your professional organization. Um, underneath that, we have some um, anchor text links to some of the uh, other internal pages on our site to further uh, create engagement. And uh, next slide. Um, internal linking. So as I, talk, as I talked about on the last slide, um, Having those keywords internally linked on your site is, is huge for, for SEO, for a user experience, for, for everything really in, in 2022. Um, a user needs to be able to have that seamless experience uh, to get more information, uh, to visit those other internal pages that are related. But more importantly, uh, this internal linking creates the relationship uh, for the search engine crawlers that these pages are important, right? So this is one of the um, one of the best strategies you can do if you're a, a new site is having your, your top pages, making sure they're all internally linked properly. Um, that way um, you can really um, spread out that authority between that site. Uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, so URLs are huge. Um, URLs, they help signal uh, to search engine what the page is about. Um, they're important not only for um, search engines, also for users. Um, you want to have your URL be understandable to a human. That way, they kind of trust that the content is um, what they expect it to be before going 
to that link. Um, and uh, next, next slide. Uh, yeah, so in, human readable URLs are um, incredibly important. Again, for that, that trust, um, if they can read that, then they can, they trust it. Um, they, they know what they're clicking on. I have an example of two different um, Ask CFPB URLs that we have. The first one um, ending in dash 202. On the last one, much more descriptive, talking about consolidating and refinancing student loans. Um, with the second URL, users, um, they trust that this content is about student loans. They can kind of already tell what it's about versus 202, they don't really know what, what that means. Uh, next slide. Um, it's important to use hyphens rather than underscores in URL structure. Um, so Google and other um, search engines, they treat hyphens like the same as word generators, um, as word separators rather. Um, they, they treat these hyphens and underscores the same way. So meaning that if you were to have um, a, a URL slug, um, red underscore sneakers, um, your, um, Google would read that just as red sneakers. It would completely negate the, uh, the hyphen or the underscore rather. So it's important to use those hyphens in your structure so that Google could differentiate um, the wording and, and not combine those words. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, so the inclusion of keywords is extremely important. Um, I talked about having uh, the keywords uh, throughout the uh, throughout the content and making sure that they're, they're linked appropriately. Um, that way, the search engines can um, kind of define that relationship between the content and the page. Um, the users can have more engaging, engagement, but also um, when that content is displayed in the SERP listing, um, ha having that um, those keywords within that that data um, really helps those those users actually click on the content. Um, next uh, next slide, please. Um, so having a, a logical folder structure is incredibly important for, for all your URLs. You want to make sure that um, there's a clear association between the content um, that you have and your previous content. So I have an example of a URL here for Homeowners Protection Act, HPA or PMI, Cancellation Examination Procedures. From this URL, you could tell that it's about this Homeowners Protection Act It's in examination procedures. You could tell it's a type of supervision examination, and it's also part of compliance. So by having this kind of subfolder structure, you can not only rank this page for uh, the main keywords of the Homeowners Protection Act, but also um, supervision, supervision examinations and compliance. Uh, next slide, please. Um, metadata, metadata is um, incredibly important um, for a click-through rate. Um, so metadata is the data that appears on Google search engine results page. We have a uh, picture right here of a search engine results listing for our submitted complaint page. Um, you can see the top part with the arrow down that is pointing to the title tag. Um, that is very important to have your keyword in that um, piece of the metadata because Google um, only looks at the uh, meta title. They used to look at the meta description and take keywords from that as well um, in, in, way, in their algorithm, but now um, they only focus on the meta title. Um, nevertheless, it's very important to have those keywords within the meta description just so that users know what they're clicking on again, having that trust um, so that we can get a higher click-through rate. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, structured data, Google's, uh, Google rich snippets. Um, structured data is extremely important. Um, known as schema markup, it's basically code that you're able to uh, put on your page that um, is able to uh, tell the search engines more information about your site. So for instance, uh, we have a, a blog post below uh, for some private mortgage insurance. We were able to uh, deploy a common schema known as frequently asked uh, question schema, FAQ schema, um, because that had some content on that that is um, question oriented that um, you know would be frequently asked. Um, and just by having that schema on there, we were not only to rank number one, but we were also able to rank for in links, which are these like um, these down arrows. If you were to click down on there, it'll bring up more more content and other links to other pages on the site, not just. Um, the, the blog post that was linked there. Next slide. 
All right, so SEO, user research, um, accessibility, they're all very, very um, much intermingled now in 2022. Um, if your site isn't accessible, Google isn't going to rank it, and you're not, you know, you're not going to have good SEO. So um, all, all these things are very, very much important and uh, very much interrelated. Um, so some of the key pieces of accessibility in terms of SEO is making sure that there's alt text on all images. Uh, that way, for the screen readers, when, when they're reading the content, they're able to display what the images are about. Um, Google definitely docs. Um, there's those sites that don't have that all text in there, as well as proper metadata on all pages, um, clear page titles and human readable URLs, as we talked about earlier, as well as having descriptive links, uh, breadcrumbs, any, any transcripts for, or text captions on any multimedia content that there might be. And a big one is inclusion of an HTML sitemap. Um, that way they're able to access the site in a way um, that's much more fluid. They're, they're not kind of bogged down with the main navigation of the site, they can more easily access their pages, especially with this uh, screen readers. And uh, next slide. All right, so I wanna talk about um, some of the um, more important Google algorithm updates. So Google, they update their algorithm like every day, like 500, 600, 700 times a year, right? A lot of those are soft updates. And every year or two, there's what they call a core update. So the last core update was the core web vitals update. And that was released in June of 2021. Um, in that update, Google placed a much higher emphasis on page speed metrics as a ranking factor. So your uh, page speed, your accessibility, mobile friendliness, those are all uh, really important in this update. Another uh, three main um, three main components of the core web vitals update. Um, there was largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. Um, so largest contentful paint is pretty much the measure of how long it takes the largest image or the largest piece of content rather on, on your site to load. So whether that is an image or a video, what have you, um, they want those, those multimedia content um, to, to load up as quickly as possible if there is any. Really doesn't like Google really doesn't like any lazy loading images. So really making sure we're compressing um, our images and our content um, is, is very important in 2022. Uh, first input delay is the next, uh, next factor um, that Google introduced with the Core Web Vitals update. Um, that's pretty much the measure of how long it takes um, a user to reach the desired input. So most commonly, um, it'll be when a user will click on like the blue anchor text link on the page. So the measure of how long it takes the user to click on that content and get displayed that that web page um, is the measure of first input delay. And uh, lastly, cumulative layout shift. Um, Google does not like um, when the layout of the web page um, gets kind of shifted as you're as you're browsing. So I'm sure you guys have all had that ex experience where you're looking at an article, or you're online, or you're reading it, you're maybe a paragraph in, and then all of a sudden you lose your train of thought. Um, there's maybe an image or an ad that comes in, shifts all the content down, and then you have to readjust, figure out where you're reading from again. Um, Google has found that has been very uh, disruptive to user experience and has um, since penalized any um, shifting content. Uh, next slide, please. So you just want to summarize um, the top uh, 2021 algorithm ranking factors um, from Google. Um, talked about largest contentful paint, cumulative layout shift, and first input delay in the last slide. Um, also making sure the site is secure. So having that HTTPS security, uh, making sure there's no intrusive interstitials and having um, the site be mobile friendly is very important in 2022 and beyond. Um, next slide. And this is slide 52. Um, I just wanted to highlight the most recent um, algorithm update. Now this was not a core update, but this was um, an update particularly focused on product reviews. Um, so on March 23rd uh, of this year, Google updated their search engine algorithm to promote quote, insightful analysis and original research on product reviews. Uh, the main takeaway from this is that any content with rank lists and co comparison reviews should be relatively short. Um, they don't wanna have long content as I found that would overwhelm the reader. And um, next slide. 
All right, and this was all we have for you. Uh, so we want to say thank you all uh, for taking the time to uh, tune into our presentation. We have links to um, our website, as well as the CFPB design system, the manual accessibility audit, Lighthouse dashboard, as well as all of our presenter email addresses. Um, so at this time, uh, we'd like to open it up for questions. Wow, that was fantastic. Um, just as a reminder, the, the slides are available at the digital.gov uh, event page for this event that was linked uh, in the chat above. We can probably link it again in case you want to get these links. Um, I just want to say before I take questions that you all have a, a, a tremendous system going for you right here. Um, I think it serves as an incredible model for other agencies, and, and we really appreciate you sharing with it all, sharing it all with us today.